Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the New Ground Life and Leadership Podcast. Today, I am very, very excited to introduce you to a good friend of mine, Mostaba Husseini. Welcome, Mostaba. Thank you so much, Jess. It's a great pleasure to be with you. It's always fun having a chat with you. Yeah. So, so we met when you were 28 years old in Yalova, a yeah. nice port just outside of Istanbul in Turkey. And you'd just arrived in Yalova a few months before, um, having only recently been released from prison, um, where you'd been in prison for four years, I believe. Three years and one month. Yeah. Three years and one month. Yeah. And it was such a privilege and treat to meet you um, in Yalova all those years ago now and, yeah. um, and connect and hear your story of how you became a Christian and then subsequently what happened. Um, so you are from Iran, where it's currently illegal to be a Christian or certainly to worship as a Christian. Yeah. Um, and currently you're, stu you're studying at St. Melitus in England, married to an English lady. And, um, and what was the other thing we were talking about? Oh, yes. And you're a, a, a speaker for Open Doors in supporting the, and raising awareness about the persecuted church. Yeah. So, Moj, I really wanted to get you on the podcast just so I could share your inspiring and uh, deeply moving story with all of our listeners. Um, so where do you want to begin? How do we introduce people to the world of Mostaba Husseini living in Iran, growing up, becoming a believer and all of that? Okay, I was uh, 18 when I first uh, heard the gospel and immediately I had a response to, to the uh, whatever I heard, uh, which everything I heard was exactly what I needed at that time. Uh, because it was talking about salvation, it was talking about forgiveness and new life, new birth, new start. And I, I just was in a point of my life that I was absolutely broken and devastated personally, my, my personal life and also my family life. So it was really hard um, time uh, I had at that time. And when I heard it immediately, I said, I want this and I need this. And my life completely changed after uh, I accepted the uh, forgiveness of Jesus and believe what, who, believed in who he is and what he has done for me. So, and since then, everything changed. Everything changed and um, in a good way and also sometimes in, in a difficult way, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, and I suppose one of the difficult ways was then what do you do having become a Christian, living in Iran, where you, you know you're not necessarily allowed to be a Christian. Talk to us about the, the political situation in Iran or the religious situation in Iran and then what your options were uh, having become a Christian. Yeah, so I was a, an ordinary person in my country and I never had any kind of uh, conflict with anyone in like with my friends or with my... Um, like anyone in my society and never had any problem with police. And when I say changing difficult, sometimes it was difficult. Some of the changes was uh, like when I was 20, I faced prison and I went to prison and not only a normal prison, it was a solitary confinement in intelligence service. So the story is when I became Christian and at first my older brother became Christian and then me and then my dad, when he saw the changes in us, he became really interested. He became Christian. And then my older sister, it was four of us and we were really wanted to find other Christians. And, um, but it wasn't really easy. Uh, the, the, you know, in Iran, there are lots of uh, official churches, buildings uh, uh, from like uh, Assyrians or, uh, Armenians and also some Anglican churches before the revolution, they built uh, buildings there. So there was a church, uh, official church in our city. Me and my brother went there and knocked the door and uh, the man said uh, they banned to, from the government, they banned to uh, let anyone uh, inside the building. And on that day we, we realized, oh, there are some restrictions for Christians. I didn't know anything about that. And then uh, um, in a, such a miraculous way, we've, we 
found some other Christians and we started to see each other in our own houses. And after a couple of like uh, a couple of times we saw each other say, oh, we really liked it. Shall we just continue it? Because we were sharing our testimonies and praying together, reading the uh, Bible together. And it was it was really special for us and it was really new for all of us. And we all of us were really kind of uh, passionate and enthusiastic for uh, learning more and finding out about it more. And we just felt a, such a close uh, connection. Uh, we felt that we, re, we some, uh, yeah, I remember uh, with these people, I just felt that I, I knew them for all of my life. And that intimacy from Holy Spirit was really pure and deep. And I really loved it. And so, um, yeah. And then again, first we realized that churches are closed in Iran few of Armenians and Assyrians, they open and they really limited. And then we didn't know that gathering in houses is something dangerous, you know. And uh, for one year, we were seeing each other. And uh, I remember when I was 20, one day early in the morning, uh, when I was preparing breakfast, there was a knock at the door. And I opened the door, there was 10 officers standing in front of the door and they were from intelligence service. And they said, uh, by the order of court, we have to research your house. And they pushed me in the house, raid right into the house. And I remember some of my family members, they were sleeping and it was really shocking for them, these men being in the house. And it was just horrible, you know? It's such a horrible and shocking experience for me. It never happened in my life. And now I'm a Christian. And I uh, see, um, I my life has changed. I'm I'm not that negative and bad person anymore. I'm a good person. I want to worship God, be a good person, you know. And uh, but now, this police is in my house and searching my, my house, and it's just it's just very terrifying, you know. And I just felt, you know, home is where you you have peace and home is where uh, is safe for you. You know, you come there. And when your home invaded very easily by these people, mm. whenever they want to just come in with no reason, no, any, any, what, what was my offense? That they just in such an aggressive way coming to my house and just uh, research anything in my life and my personal life and questioning about my belief what i believe you know now i'm in western context context i i understand how how um, um how can i say it shocking is to just uh kind of um punish someone for what they believe like i believe in god in this way or in that way you know so anyway so it was a very terrifying experience uh so and then, yeah, they, they took me to um, solitary confinement for 21 days, interrogating me about my faith, about the gatherings we had, and all this stuff. So it was my own personal uh, experience, the yeah. first one, you know. Uh, you, so you're age 20, 10 officers, which, I mean, let's just say 10 officers at the door. Like, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. that's, that feels a little bit excessive. Uh, what did they think they were going to find? You know, they're going, they're going to investigate a Christian church and they, they bring 10, not 10 officers. But at age 20, only been a believer for two years. And I think for many Christians, particularly in the West, at age 20, even if they've grown up in church their whole life, their knowledge of what they believe and what Christianity is is, is quite limited. But yet, at, at just two years of believer, you were so kind of committed to following Christ, it made such an impact in your life that you you weren't tempted to say, "Oh no, no, I'm not a Christian. Um, don't don't persecute me. Don't interrogate me. I'm quite happy. I'll go back. I promise I won't do it again." What was it for you that made you decide, "I'm gonna I'm gonna hold on to this. I'm not. I am a Christian, and I yeah. do want to live for Christ, and I am gonna admit that, even if it means I get thrown into prison." Yeah. So I I uh, I didn't really uh, look. When I when I became Christian, uh, it was two months, nearly two months that I was my life was changed and 
I, I experienced the gift of new birth and I didn't know I'm Christian, you know, but I was living with Christ and I loved Christ and I just loved this uh, relationship, you know, and this person, it was the person of Jesus, you know, mm. and, and then and I realized they call it Christian, you know, I mean, it's being Christian, it means this. And, but later on, I, I, you know, being a Christian, the term Christian has lots of anyone can, uh, you, you, you see different people with different um, kind of uh, ideas, like in a religious term, you see it as a Christian or relational term, you use it uh, as a Christian. But anyway, uh, what I mean is, for me, was just being a Christian, I'm not a Christian anymore, or I'm a Christian now, it wasn't like that at all. It was just a, like a really, uh, a, a, um, uh, how can I say, a, a, a real relationship, a experience I had with this person of Jesus. You know, not only me, my brother who was struggling with drugs and depression, his life completely changed. And myself with lots of bad habits and addictions, meaningless, feeling really empty and broken. And just, I, I, I remember before I become Christian, I was just keep saying, there is no point of living anymore. As someone who is 18 and must have like ambitions and uh, we, uh, goals for their life and just be uh, kind of, uh, how can I say it, uh, enthusiastic for the life and go, go on and uh, uh, build a future. But I just, it was like at age 18 and it says, that's enough. I don't want to live anymore. So, but believing in Christ. Uh, just change everything just brought a huge meaning uh, to my life for me you know that my life is not summarized by this uh, short life I have here life is so much bigger and it's beautiful and God is love and God loves me and and I am someone important in God's kingdom and I can make changes and I you know, it was happening you know mm -hmm. during those two uh, two years before I become arrested mm -hmm. uh, many things change in my life and people's lives around me and I and I was so amazed by seeing all these changes so it wasn't really and uh, it was yeah it was a very pure relationship uh, for me with uh, Jesus that when we're talking to me literally it was like uh, the in in chapter nine I remember this story of uh, the blind man in chapter nine mm -hmm. John in chapter nine, that uh, when he was, when Jesus healed him and he, um, he was standing before the uh, Pharisees and they were, uh, uh, it was like in a court. They said, you, you have to stop talking about this man who healed you. He said, I, I don't know. I was blind and I, I can't see now. What can I do? You know what I mean? And it was literally like, like me. And I said, look, I, it, it was my life. And Jesus changed me. I don't care about that, yeah. Christianity or anything else. You have any idea about it. My life was changed. I don't know what to do. It's wow. something real, you know? Yeah. Literally, it was, my answer was just like that. But they would just keep saying that it is absolutely against Islam. Islam is our, uh, the, the main religion in this country. And uh, this country is based on Islam and you're not allowed to talk about any uh, God except from the God of Islam. You yeah. know? So the, the way they react is, so the way they react, is it like you're being anti-patriotic? You're trying to undermine what made Iran great by doing this. Is that the kind of the reason they clamp down on it so much? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, so I can, I completely understand that. Like that, that is a, that is the purest testimony there is, isn't it? We're not, we're not defending Christianity when I'm not a Christian so much as someone who's just met Christ. And that's what we're called to do, to follow him and be his disciple. Um, so they put you in solitary confinement, you said, for 21 days, which um, it's easy to say that as a sentence. But I imagine the reality of that must have been terrifying. And so when they put you in this cell and close the door, do you know how long you're going to be there for? Is you think this could be it now? You must have been terrified. Yeah, it, it was literally... As I, uh, so they put me, they, at first they were interrogating me and they put like, like questions in front of me and I didn't answer. 
and then they they came back and when they saw I haven't answered any questions, they become really angry and they put again another paper front of me and I didn't do it again. And the guy, the interrogator became really, this time really angry, say, okay, take him to solitary confinement and he will get a lesson and then he knows how to write the answers. And as I heard the word social confinement, I was terrified. <laughs> and then, uh, and then, yeah, they took me uh, to this cell, which was two two meters than six meters, and uh, really small. And there was nothing in the room except from a pillow and a blanket for sleeping. And the toilet was in the corner. And um, as I walked in, literally, I, I the only reaction I could have it was just crying, and I, it was I, I didn't know what to do. It was so big, and I just uh, fell on the ground and just crying, and and it was very suffocating. Is that the word? Suffocating, you know? It was I. It was like I, I can't breathe, and just being in this such a small room, and there is just door with a kind of small window on it that the every uh, morning or for your meals they 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 would give you your food through that and it was really difficult for for the first night i couldn't sleep at all i just had night uh, nightmares and um but um as yeah i um uh, i i remember that um i had to walk around the cell uh, all the time and because if, if I would stop and just think it would be um, how can I say it, it my all so they, let me let me explain it like this because there is nothing there to like make yourself busy the only activity you have is just thinking you know and because you're not on a, in like a, in a peaceful state even when we are in a peaceful state, normally we think negative, you know, the negative thoughts is then the uh, kind of first thoughts coming to our thoughts. And we not all, always naturally think positive. Oh, it's going to be a great day. You know, we just worry about things. And uh, so especially when you are in this environment, that your life is in absolute danger, you have the worst thoughts in your mind you know and imaginations and you just every moment you think now they come and take you for to and go take you and torture you or i don't know what and i've i i, I heard lots of bad stuff about for about indigenous service that they very horrible they do horrible things to people and you constantly think about these things and also thinking about your family about your friends other church members and what's happening and all these thoughts coming to you and just wants to uh, kind of tie to you and don't let you to have one single positive thought. And, and it, it, yeah, you just uh, tied by stress, anxiety, fear, and all these kind of things. So uh, what happened uh, was that I started to walking constantly around the room and just praying, praying, praying and worshiping song by, out loud, you know, I had to hear my voice and I had to just proclaim and it was just by my words and by, by my faith, uh, just have the heavenly perspective, you know, and that put God above everything and just proclaim it constantly in all those negative thoughts and just walking around and then uh yeah, i remember every day from the morning till evening i would walking mm. I, I was walking and uh sometimes my knees would hurt and but i just saw myself in the friend line uh front front line of of a, of a war that i have to this time you can't just sit back and let things happen to you you have to fight if you don't fight they they reach to the uh the goal they they want because they put you in certain confinement to control you not only you physically they control you mentally yeah. by solitary confinement like uh, they uh, they uh, they were using blindfold a lot you know from my house taking me to to uh, to the intelligence service, they use blindfold and handcuffs. And in the in that in that place, constantly I had uh, blindfold uh, on my eyes, 
except uh, uh, when I was in my room, you know. So it'd be all these messages was handcuffs, blindfold, solitary confinement, uh, horrible interrogations, and uh, all the threats. The message of all of them was, we are in charge, we are in control. You are, you, you are no one, you are small, you, you have no power. But I had to proclaim God's power on all of them, you know? And I remember I was praying constantly, God, if this door is shut, but you can go through all the chains and doors and walls and nothing can stop you, you know, mm. you can move the mountains. If if my hands are tight, uh, you, your hands are free. You, you've got the almighty arm who can remove everything. And the, the heart of this uh, rule is in your uh, hand, you know, you can, you can, you are the one who uh, control everything. So you are the sovereign Lord. I had to, um, um, proclaim all of them. Yeah, I can certainly see how this this is like a battle you're describing. Then you're having to fight for your mental health, fight for your spiritual health, fight in prayer against the forces of darkness. You realize you're not. I mean, as Paul says, we don't fight against flesh and blood. So you realize in that moment that it's against the principalities and powers that you're doing war. Um, so that lasted for 21 days. Yeah, that's a long time, isn't it? Three weeks of just nothing but two by six room. Um, walking around, pacing, trying to like, hold that. Yeah. What I mean, were there moments in that as well where you you sensed God's presence? Were there moments in that where you felt like utterly terrified? You've described to me before about the the solitude, like pressing down like a physical force on your head. Um, yeah. Talk to us a bit more about that. Um, so, um, there was time. Yes, I I felt God's presence powerfully. But there was time that I couldn't feel God's presence at all. And that was the most uh, kind of, um, how, how can I say? It was like annoying that <laughs> I'm in persecution because of my faith. I thought that you're going to be with me and you strengthen me. And I see your glory in persecution, like the stories I've heard. But it wasn't like that sometimes, you know what I mean? And you, you say to yourself, oh, I'm here for my faith, but why God is not here? Uh, what I don't, why I can't feel, feel God, you know? And then, then there was some reasons for it. But the, um, generally, it was a contrast between faith and fear always, you know, weakness and strength. It was me and Holy Spirit, let me say this. And uh, God was... You know, the, the whole journey was kind of, uh, it has different purposes. It wasn't only like because of my faith. Sometimes I felt that God called me to be here to build my faith for something in future, you know, to shape my character. And uh, he was like saying, I'm with you. I'm just changing something in you or giving something in you or removing something from you. And it was uh, sometimes like a discipleship, a personal discipleship for me with Jesus going through that, you know, uh, learning some stuff. Uh, but I, um, I, and also there was a time of Mojtaba being a human, experiencing that humanity. Uh, is that right? Human humanity, yeah. Humanity in this experience, uh, like every human, even they not believer. If they come to such a confinement, they will experience these things, you know, like yeah, Jesus, yeah. who became a human, he experienced pain, he experienced all this stuff. So my pain, what I learned was my pain, my struggles, uh, my brokenness and my weaknesses and my faults and my uh, mistakes, I'm not defined by them. And the, the presence of God, not not uh, is not defined by these things what i learned was you know if if i feeling weary if i'm trembling if i feeling if i'm doubting it doesn't mean god is not there you know mm -hmm. god is god is a truth above everything it's not defined by our emotions so i i, I remember that as i stopped defining god's presence by my feelings and my emotions and measure god's presence by 
my honest when I'm happy when I I'm joyful and it helped me during the I was a new believer you know at that time but this this it was a kind of a, a big lesson for me yeah. throughout all of my faith life my journey it helped me wow. uh, if you don't accept God's uh, presence just with blessings you know yeah. have faith God will bless you you have faith God will um heal you you know if, if you don't receive healing maybe your faith is not good enough you know if you don't have blessing enough or if you don't feel sh- strong enough maybe your faith is not good enough but it's not true at all it's not the measure of faith and um, um god's presence the measure of that is just being in relationship in him you know, like share your vulnerability in an honest way with mm, people you know, not, not, not like not a good person or bad person, like a good believer or bad believer. You you are just with him, in him. You are in a journey. You are in a relationship with him. So he was something like this for me. That's beautiful. Uh, thank you for those insights as well. Really helpful comments. Um, I, I'm, I'm aware. So we're 21 days into this journey, and I know that we've got uh, many years to cover. So let's. <laughs> I've got lots of questions, a lot to, to pick up. So you. I know that um, after this period of solitary confinement, the intelligence service released you under the the provision or whatever the word is, um, that you don't carry on meeting with other Christians. Is that correct? Yeah, I did. So they gave me a suspended sentence. Okay. It was eight months prison sentence. But if you uh, like continue your activities within the next five years, we will arrest you again enforce this eight months and give you a new sentence and so uh, with that hanging over your head and knowing the knowing the new danger on top of the old danger of meeting what did you do did you carry on meeting or did you stop meeting with believers and just try to be a christian on your own yeah so um our court process took one year and uh, it was me and three more Christians uh, from the house church members. And uh, so we, we, during that one year, we had to see each other for the court uh, sessions, you know? And so, yeah, we were seeing each other. But, uh, one of the thing was, I always says that, that without my other believers, I couldn't make one, moment one second of persecution literally <laughs> it was without the presence and the encouragement and yeah just them i couldn't make it and that's that's my testimony even they said we are a family being together and going through this together so we i remember we uh, we we were singing song even before our court sessions sitting in the court uh, building uh, we were waiting for the judge calling us into his room and um, just singing songs and praying and just say, God is uh, powerful. God is on it. Let's go in. Nothing will happen. So we have like our, a place on our fellowship became like the court building. It's, you know, but we would see each other in public places. Mm. And, uh, but after a while, um uh through like friends relatives and especially because we were arrested and everyone knew now that in my family like all the relatives and Mojtawa is a christian now you know and uh, some of them would talk to me and some of some of them would introduce being raised to me oh i know someone who is christian so uh it started our numbers started to grow you know and uh and we had to see each other in our houses again. And it was really, <laughs> uh, yeah, it, was, it wasn't an easy decision. But I remember one day with one of the other guys who was uh, convicted with me and he, he, he has two children, you know? And we, uh, one day I told him, look, we are, again, we are gathering and we, we have gatherings and, it's dangerous and you have two children are you sure you want to continue this and he he said yes what what else i can do i i was 
I was already dead, you know, and I, I don't care about prison stuff. He was addicted to drugs for 30 years and uh, nothing could help him getting rid of the drugs. And he had to take in lots of sleeping uh, pills uh, for sleeping. But with just one single prayer, when he gave his heart to Jesus, he didn't have any desire for drugs anymore. Wow. His testimony was just amazing. Mm. And he said, look, my family was part of, uh, falling apart and, uh, and Jesus changed my life and saved my life. And he made everything beautiful. And I, I believe the one who changed me in this way, he is, uh, he is uh, strong enough to um, protect my family and protect me for, for the next step as well. Wow. So he, he was, he, yeah, he, his testimony was absolutely amazing. So he really encouraged me. And I said, okay, if you want to continue, let's continue. And we continued, had our meetings, our numbers from 20 people, increased to 150 nearly 150 people and we had lots of meetings in different places and just yeah became became busy again with wow so you suddenly find yourself involved with pastoring and, and part of a church of 150 200 people scattered yeah. in different house churches scattered yeah. and um like most of them seeing them in uh, one by one or such a small groups okay uh, just very, it wasn't like, you know, um, it's the church concept is very different, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that. So, um, yeah. So, so, what happened on the day that you were arrested then that led to your imprisonment for, for several years? What? Sorry, say it again. Tell us about what happened then when you were imprisoned. Um, how did that happen that you got imprisoned a second time, um, which is the one that we, I alluded to earlier when I said I just met you and you'd been out of prison, having been there for three years? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, one, one night uh, in one of our uh, meetings, we were, whilst we were worshipping, there was a knock at the door. And uh, each time that, the, like, there was a knock at the door during that uh, three years and a half, after the first, uh, I mean, after the court finished, um, every time, I mean, hearing any uh, phone calls or knock at the door, it was just like, oh, they here, they here, they here, and we, yeah, that night again, some of the one of the uh, boys in our meeting when there was knock at the door, and he was always making joke that. Oh, they're here. <laughs> oh, they're here. <laughs> and this time he said he made his joke again and he said, Oh, they're here. And he went and opened the door. And unfortunately, yeah, there was a very dark, dark evening, literally. And uh, it, it was like 30 offices, uh, a big group of offices. They, Right into the house in such an aggressive way, shouting at people uh, and just ordering people to sit down on your seat and you, you, you're not allowed to move, collecting all the uh, mobile phones and children were in the other room and they came out, they were crying, terrified, and uh, they didn't let to children going to their uh, parents separated women and men and just filming everyone giving a paper to people write down why you are here who invited you here and just horrible questions you know and um, they separated leaders me and other like other five people who were uh, leading all these meetings we were the most active ones they separated us, took us to another room, put handcuffs on us and blindfold and took us to intelligence service. And it was really, really a heavy and dark night, you know? So yeah, they took me again and all of us to solitary confinement, separately in different cells, the same situation like four years before that, you know, when I was 20. And at that time I was 24. And but experiencing long time, you know, uh, social confinement, it wasn't like I'm experienced now. I know what I'm doing here. It was as hard as before and even harder. 
and again things happen or many experiences I had in that time in uh, solitary confinement and af after that day uh, after 33 days being in solitary confinement lots of intrigations about all the activities and everything uh, yeah all the activities I had um, and they sent all of us to public prison in my city Shiraz and um, it was a big prison with nearly 6,000 to 8,000 prisoners in it. And it's one of the, one of the uh, most horrible prisons in, in Iran. And it's so big, big, big prisons. And it's just not, it's not, you, you can't compare it to Western prisons, you know? And uh, it's very horrible uh, crimes and, yeah, I mean, one night I was in, the first night I was in there, uh, murderous, um, murderous cell part, which was like, so there was like 12 parts. Uh, I don't know how to say parts or salons. And each, each one of them had three floors. And in each floor, there was like a corridor, long corridor, like 200 meters and like 20, uh, rooms on the left and 20 rooms on the right and there's a full of people you know in each room like a normal size of this room but with 15 16 uh, people with like bank beds in it and just people sleeping on the on the floor and it's full, full of people everywhere just full of people and it's so dirty so uh, violent environment and that one night I just slept in that uh, murder part and it was just the most terrifying things in mm. my life. in a cell surrounded by people you know who are there yeah. because they've committed murder it was it was crazy it was crazy i couldn't believe it i'm i'm there yeah mm. on the first night or the second night that you were in that public prison i remember you sharing with me before though something encouraging that the lord did um can you remind us of that or tell us about that yeah, there is a lot of uh, things, but I think what, what you're saying is the first time when I was 20. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. I got yeah. I, so actually that was, that was a yeah, great system. And he, uh, so when I was, uh, when they said I, I can be released by bail, which was $20,000. Um, yeah. At that time, it, I realized how expensive I am, how valuable. <laughs> <laughs> I think my dad said, that's for you. <laughs> <We don't need> <laughs> <it>. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, they for for waiting, waiting for the bill, uh, like my family bringing the, uh, the bail, uh, they sent me to public prison for two days. And before going there, I was so terrified. I was 20 and I heard lots of horrible stuff about prisons for young people being really vulnerable and in danger of being raped. And I was just say, oh gosh, God, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I, I'm so terrified. I was really terrified. It was one of, I mean, I, after 20 years in my life, I think it was the first time I was terrified like that. Anyway, I, I was sitting waiting in a uh, somewhere to take me to to public prison, and I was so uh, yeah so scared. I don't know, and it was for the first time I was experiencing this. I don't know how. I just said the first line of the Psalms 23, and I said, "God is my shepherd; I shall not want." You know, is that right in English? Yeah. yeah. I, I just said this sentence, and for the first time in my life, I uh, I experienced a great peace. Uh, literally, I was like praying like this. I even I physically I like became like a strong like s s sitting straight, you know. Mm -hmm. And I just received a great courage from God, and just had this saying every word of that. God is my shepherd, I shall not want. It just gave me literally uh, a great courage uh, that, look, God is with you, nothing gonna happen. Don't worry at all. And I just felt it uh, strongly. And um, I remember after saying that sentence, till I was there 
for two days till I became released from that place. I didn't have any fear and stress at all, believe me. And when I got there, uh, that's what I uh, yeah, shared with you before. In, in, um, so it was, as I expre uh, explained, a really busy place. Randomly, I slept uh, in one of the beds and I just look at the bank beds, you know, uh, uh, bunk bed. Uh, there, there was a picture of Jesus. I mean, uh, there was a, a poster, a, a picture, uh, Mary holding um, Jesus uh, in, his, in her arms after he was crucified. And I just said, where, where, where was this in, in whole of this um, uh, prison, you know? big prison i'm laying down in this and watching this and as i saw this there was a message for me like i i told you i'm with you there was a sign i'm with you and yeah and it was just amazing that how god is there and doing all of these things yeah you, you told me about a time that um there was a a, a particularly notorious individual who was in there for i think drugs um drug dealing yeah. and um you were able to share the lord with him do you remember that yeah he was a head of a gang his name was muhammad and he he was uh, sentenced to execution and he was a sunni muslim when he heard that the christian he came to us and started questioning Christianity, making arguments about Islam and Christianity and how good is, is Islam is and Islam is the perfect religion, the last religion that everyone should believe in, in, in that and about Muhammad and all these kind of things. And he just arguing, arguing, arguing. And I remember I, I was coming from solitary confinement it was the first week I was there. And I, like the first few days I was in prison. I was so confused and feeling really down and didn't know missing my family and just worrying about everything and didn't have <clears throat> any desire to share the gospel. <laughs> Literally <laughs> didn't have, like didn't have this energy to talk about uh, Jesus right now with this person, especially I didn't know what, his reaction gonna be, you know? And um, I told him, look, I don't know why you're just arguing, fighting with us. And it's because it's, it's, not, it's not about us, it's about Jesus himself. If you have any problem, you can fight with himself. And he, he said, what do you mean? He, he thought I'm pulling his leg and I'm just like making fun of him. I just want to get rid of him. He said, what do you mean I can, fight with himself and talk to himself. I said, look, I believe, and the Bible says Jesus is alive. And I spoke to him and prayed to him. He answered me. And I and I just tell you tonight, if you want, when you want to go to sleep, you can pray to Jesus and say, if you are really there and you, if you are uh, really alive, you can reveal yourself to me. And this man, yeah. He went and the next day he went back and he was a completely different person. And he just gave me this, he just told his story that um, last night when he prayed after a long time that he couldn't sleep because every night he was just sitting in his bed thinking about execution. And there was, there was a problem of many prisoners, you know, thinking about their sentence, thinking about their lives. So, at night times, it was really interesting times. No one would sleep, you know, and just everyone. The day would start in prison, they say at night. The, the day will start, actually, again. And anyway, so he, he just slept like a baby. In the morning, he woke up and he didn't have any. Uh, he, he just had a great peace and had a strange feelings. And the name of Jesus was just pounding in his mind. And. Uh, make the long story short, he just, he always changed, you know, and he just prayed with me, and since then, for five uh, months, we were together, praying together, I was telling the uh, Bible's story to him, 
and he was so passionate and enthusiastic about it. And uh, one day he gave me this testimony that I'm not terrified of death anymore. I, I feel this peace and feeling peace and um, kind of love I, I have from Jesus. I, I feel that even if I die now, I will be with him and I believe in every single word you tell me about um, Bible. And, and he said, I can't wait to become released and going to my city and tell everyone about Jesus. But he was telling his family over the phone, you know. And um, yeah, it was amazing. But after I, we were separated uh, at that time, after five months, we were separated. And I was in different parts of prison. And one day I heard that they were executed, Muhammad. And it was, it was such a uh, unique and special moment for me, you know, being in prison next to this criminal person, you know, sharing gospel with him at the end of his life. And he become Christian and then go. I mean, it's just uh, crazy, you know, experience these things. And God just gave him a message that, all of your suffering, everything you've, you, you've been through and everything you will go through is worth it for this man, you know? And he showed me how valuable is one person for him. Mm. And uh, as in preachers, we hear that if even one person was on the, on the earth, God would come and die for that person. And God just, yeah, kind of expand my heart for people and we saw more people came to Christ in prison and just gave a meaning to why I'm here it's like a mission mm -hmm. you know it's like a it's like you know when we read the bible um, Jesus in New Testament was the only person who became close to lepers you know and loved lepers and hugged lepers and everyone was terrified <laughs> so this man is crazy Lepers were rejected far away from society. You know, they were baddies, they were dirty, and no one would care about them. But Jesus became close to them. And prisoners is like that. You know, prison is rejected from society. They are baddies, they are there, no one care about them. But still, God wants to love them, you know. And in Iran, here is easy through alpha groups and different ways you can go in prison. But in Iran, it's not possible going and knock the door and saying, can we can we come in prison, talk about God to these people, help them and blah, blah. They won't accept this, you know, they put yourself in prison for that. But God wanted us to wear, to clothe us, prisoners, take us in and then share the gospel with these people, you know, and stretch his arm and love these people, lepers who were rejected from society you know so it, yeah yeah that's amazing and so yeah powerful to hear the lord the lord's arm is not too short to say even in those situations where there are people that you think the world's forgotten and rejected yeah. um, it's such a, a privilege and joy to connect with you and hear your story again um, obviously there's a lot more we could talk about I met you have, when you'd been in prison for three as I mentioned at age 27 and uh, it's funny when we when we met one another we kind of got on very well and I and I knew in my spirit that this was not gonna be the last time I would see Mostaba <laughs> just connecting for those few hours in Yalava and then um, a couple of years later you gave me a phone call one day to say that you were in my town on the beach and can you come around for a cup of tea <laughs> so, oh my goodness the Lord does do mysterious and wonderful things yeah. in bringing people together across the world um, and so currently you're you're doing speaking um, for Open Doors, as I mentioned at the start, and uh, looking to support and encourage the persecuted church um, at various conferences. And uh, alongside that, uh, training to be ordained with the Anglican Church at St. Melissa's College. Yeah. Um, sounds like you've got a, a, it's amazing what the Lord's doing, done in your life and, and doing through you still. Um, I, I'd really love to have you come back on the podcast and sure. share with us more about the persecuted church more generally, um, what God's doing through the various uh, groups like Open Doors and what they're, what they're up to. So you'd yeah. have to come back with us and share some more at another time. Would that be okay? Yeah, definitely. Why not? 
Uh, but Moshtaba, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing with us such a beautiful and sacred story. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Jess. That's great. And the viewers, the people who are, who are listening to this podcast need to check out the YouTube channel to see this man's smile. You just have the best smile in the world. Your face is radiant, always full of joy. Um, and so it's just, yeah, the Lord really does shine through you. And so I wish you and your, and your dear wife, Hannah, well, and look forward to connecting with you again soon. Cheers. Yeah, thank you. I have to say that you also are very competitive, which I learned when we played Settlers of k oh, yes. But... <laughs> <laughs> you lost last time. I, I didn't lose. You lost. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> let's, let's talk about it now. <laughs>